Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Kevin, for that uh, remarkable introduction. I, I think you captured, frankly, exactly what I've been trying to do, and I'm very grateful. And <clears throat> I hope that by showing up this evening uh, for this extraordinary turnout that I have uh, finally made Daryl happy. Uh, <laughs> he told me early on I had to come do it, and therefore, out of old personal friendship, we did. And, uh, I like coming back to Iowa for a lot of reasons. As many of you know, um, my wife, Callista, went to Luther College, and our national campaign chairman, Michael Kroll, is from here, and we have many ties here. But I think, particularly in terms of my candidacy, I like coming here because I like coming to a state where, you know, you could have been out of office for a while, you could have been a little older, you could return and win the governorship, I was at Terry's birthday party that night, and I told him what an inspiration to me he was. <laughs> and frankly, when you watch the budget deal they got compared to what Washington has been like, we could use a lot more Terry Branstead and a lot less Barack Obama <laughs> in this country. I'm always glad also to come back to Chuck Grassley State he is the only person, I think, still in office who voted with me in 1984 for Gasohol, which for the younger folks is what ethanol was called when Ronald Reagan first signed it into law. So we go back a long way. Um, as many of you know, I was uh, supposedly in June and July dead. So it is great to be back. And I have to confess that while I was hoping for a wave, we've had sort of a tsunami. But I thought about, therefore, what should I talk about tonight? And I want to give you a talk that really builds off of Kevin's introduction. Because I want to talk about the possibility that we have to rebuild the America that we love. We're in a mess. We're in a mess in Washington. We're in a mess economically. We're in a mess with radical judges. You just go down the list. But I think it's wrong to focus primarily on the mess. We've been here before, 1979, 1980. Jimmy Carter got us into 13% inflation, 22% interest rates, 10.8% unemployment, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, 444 days of a hostage crisis. Carter finally, in despair, went on television and gave a famous malaise speech in which he said, everything's going to be a lot worse, but at least we can share the misery equally. <laughs> I didn't make that up. <laughs> Ronald Reagan came along, and a theme you may hear next year, and he said, you know, if your brother-in-law is unemployed, it's called a recession. If you're unemployed, it's called a depression. If Jimmy Carter's unemployed, it's called a recovery. <laughs> so I want to predict to you tonight that the economic recovery will begin late on election night, when the country realizes that Barack Obama is going back to Chicago and that the Republicans have won control of the Senate. <clears throat> Literally that evening, investment decisions, job creation decisions, company launching decisions will be changing in the light of what's going on. Now for that to happen, we have to have a team campaign. And as your state chairman knows, I am totally committed to a team campaign. I've told Linda Upmeyer that, I've told the governor that, and you can count on me as the nominee being back here helping in the fall, because my whole career has been spent like that. In 1980, 
I was the first person to ever organize a Capitol Steps event with Governor Ronald Reagan and all the House and Senate candidates. In 1994, we organized the contract with America and had 350 candidates nationwide running as a team. In 2010, working with American Solutions, we helped organize efforts across the country, including here. And the great victory wasn't the U.S. House. The great victory was that we picked up 680 state legislative seats in, that night and another 25 when the Democrats switched. And today we have the largest number of state legislators since 1925. <clears throat> so we need to have a team effort next year. We need to put a team together. We need to win as a team. I've begun at newt.org to outline the first stages of a 21st century contract with America to indicate where a team might go. But, but I want to spend a few minutes tonight and talk about why we're doing all this. You know, this isn't just about petty politics. This isn't just so we can have a great victory party. This is because we have a vision of America as a country that we love, a country that we feel is literally at its very core endangered by current policies, and we want to set the country back on the right track. Now, why is that worth doing? And I think sometimes we need to stop and revisit what this is all about. This has been, for 225 years, the most successful society in the history of the world. It's extraordinary. You can come from anywhere on the planet, and you arrive here, and you become absorbed, and you become an American, and you quit fighting over the past, and you start building the future. You have people who migrate here from Serbia and Bosnia who would have killed each other. And now their kids are on the same soccer team or the same basketball team or the same baseball team. They're in business together trying to create wealth because they're Americans. People learn to be American faster than you would have thought it possible. But what is this thing and how do we rebuild it? And this is really far more than the incidental data about the debt or the unemployment or whatever you want to pick that the news media focuses on. This is really the core argument we have with Barack Obama. Barack Obama is legitimately and authentically a Saul Alinsky radical. He believes in a world in which the classic America has disappeared. He believes in a world in which the United Nations is more important than the United States Congress. He believes in a world of international law rather than the U.S. Constitution. And we will have an opportunity to have a discussion about that next year. But let's assume for a few minutes that we've won. What then would happen? What kind of country would we create? And it starts at first principles, and I want all of you to understand that. Because I'm running as a candidate of first principles. I begin as Lincoln did. Lincoln said on his way to the inauguration when he stopped in Philadelphia in February of 1861. And he gave a speech at Independence Hall. And he said he did not know of a single major part of his political beliefs that did not come from the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln had been born very poor. He had at most a year and a half of formal education. He taught himself to be a lawyer. He knew that in any other country in the world, he would have had a limited future. But in America, he had an unlimited future. And so he treasured. He's really the man who brings back to the center of our life the Declaration. Now, why is this important? It's the founding document. It's the base of everything. And what does it say? It says we hold these truths to be self-evident. Not situation ethics, not theoretical philosophy, the Founding Fathers were seriously, desperately trying to understand the truth of self-government, of who we are and who we can be. <clears throat> that all men are created equal. And yes, they would all have said to you, of course it's inadequate at the present time. Of course that doesn't recognize fully the role of women. Of course it doesn't fully recognize the problem of slavery. 
but as an aspiration towards which the country should move, it is the boldest, most radical statement in history. Remember, this was written at a time of kings and emperors and czars and dictators. And then they went on to say, where do our rights come from? We are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If, with your help, I end up as President of the United States, I will dedicate eight years to making those words real. Now, what, what does that mean, rebuilding the America we love by making the Declaration real? Well, let's go back and look at the words for a minute. One of the reasons the Founding Fathers deeply disliked big government is it fundamentally violated the principle that we're all equal. If you read Gordon Wood's tremendous books on the radicalism of the American Revolution and the intellectual origins of the American Revolution, he makes quite clear that the Americans are all part of the Whig critique of the British monarchy. They all believe the following things. Big government is always corrupt, not because people bribe each other, <clears throat> but because decisions are made to pay off local political interest at the cost of the general good. Might I say the word Solyndra as an example? <laughs> but let's not kid ourselves. This is something I've been very sobered by for the last three months. The longer I have thought about the very real possibility that I might have to serve, the more I realize we have to clean up the Congress as much as we have to clean up the executive branch. And I have also come to realize that we need an American campaign, not a Republican campaign. And we need to be open to every person of every background who shares our commitment. And you and I know that's going to make some of our friends very uncomfortable. But I think if we, if we truly want to rebuild America, we have to be prepared to make some of our friends very uncomfortable. Now in that context, the Founding Fathers go on to say, we're endowed by our Creator. This is the heart of the American argument. Where do our rights come from? The Founding Fathers unanimously agreed. God endows each one of you personally, which means you're personally sovereign. Notice it says the rights are unalienable. That means no judge, no bureaucrat, no politician can take away your rights. Now this is the most radical statement in, in political history because it says we're centering sovereignty on you which is why you are a citizen. You're not a subject. In Europe, you were subjects. It's this wonderful story of Franklin, who goes to Europe. Franklin is one of the most successful and most extraordinary people in all of American history. Leaves Boston at 13 to go to apprentice to his, his uncle in Philadelphia, learns how to be a printer, becomes an extraordinarily successful businessman, a great writer, produces annually Poor Richard's Almanac, writes a brilliant autobiography, becomes in passing a scientist, is, one, is, is the only American, I believe, I, I could be wrong, but I think he's the only American admitted to the Royal Academy of Science, is a world-renowned scientist, discovers electricity, develops the lightning rod, invents bifocal glasses, develops the Franklin stove, helps found the American Philosophical Society, is the first uh, postmaster general of the United States, does all this, I mean, just an amazing, energetic person. And he's hired by, the colony, by Pennsylvania to go to London and to represent the colony. And as Gordon Wood wrote, he left America an Englishman. 
And after years of living in London and realizing that the aristocracy would never accept him, that no matter how rich, no matter how brilliant, no matter how personable, he would never be accepted. He came back to America an American. And that's why we are citizens and not subjects. And that's why the Environmental Protection Agency's arrogance and the Justice Department's arrogance and every other arrogance of Washington bureaucrats is anti-American at its core and has to be fundamentally uprooted and replaced by people who understand that they are servants of the American people. We are not servants of the government. Part of what got me back into public life was the Ninth Circuit decision in 2002 that one nation under God as part of the Pledge of Allegiance was unconstitutional. And my conclusion was, if we had gotten to a point, this remember is a phrase which Lincoln writes in, in hand, sitting on the dais, looking out over the first national military cemetery at Gettysburg. And I concluded, if we now have judges so radical and so anti-American, that they believe that even the reference to one nation under God is unconstitutional, that the time has come to draw a line in the sand. I wrote a paper, which you can see at newt.org on judicial reform. And I can promise you that one of the first acts I will propose to the Congress will be to close the office of Judge Barry in San Antonio who is a uniquely anti-religious bigot who issued a June 1st order that said not only could students not pray at their graduation, they could not use the word benediction, they could not use the word invocation, they could not ask the audience to stand, they could not reference God, they could not ask for a moment of silence, and if any of these were violated, he would put their superintendent in jail. We do not have to tolerate anti-religious judges who seek to impose in this country a fundamental violation of the Declaration. How are you going to explain we're endowed by our Creator if it becomes illegal to say the word Creator? <laughs> and if you think I exaggerate, go look at schools today and what they don't teach. And look at the amount of American history they refuse to talk about. And look at the bias built into the academic community against American history, against American founding fathers, against American institutions. <laughs> Among these unalienable rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I want to take a minute to talk about the last one because I think it's a key example of how big the change is if we're seriously going to rebuild the America we love. First of all, the term pursuit of happiness in the Scottish Enlightenment where it came from actually references virtue. It does not reference hedonism and acquisition. And the concept in that generation was that true happiness came from virtue. And they were very passionate. If you go back, I wrote a small book called Rediscovering God in America, and Clist and I turned it into a movie. And you go back and you look at the founding fathers. It's amazing how deeply they felt this. They said, a people who refuse to be self-disciplined cannot possibly be free. Jefferson said, people who hope to be both ignorant and free are asking for something which is impossible. In the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which organized Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, and part of Wisconsin, the Founding Fathers write, religion, morality, and knowledge being important, or being vital. Schools are important, and they set up public schools. But notice what the order was. They really wanted us to understand how to live a good life, not how to live a rich life. And they felt it in their bones. Now, what does that mean? And again, I'm sort of warning you in case I, you decide you really want to support me. <laughs> it means I have a passionate dedication to the work ethic. I think we need to reinstill the work ethic.
The president the other day said the American people had grown lazy. Well, it's a Jimmy Carter system. You know, once it starts to fail, somebody else must have done it. He couldn't have done it because he was perfect. Therefore, you wonder how it happened. So who did it? You must have done it because, after all, how could he have done it? <laughs> but actually, he misses. It's fascinating to watch liberals try to avoid reality. And, and let me say this at two levels, because the president's comment on laziness is really worth our thinking about at great length. And it fits into the concern of the New York Times for inequality. Because I would argue that the last 50 years, the rise of bureaucratism has encouraged laziness and has crippled the poor. We have created environments where children are sent to schools whose only function is to pay off the union. It's utterly irrelevant if the school fails the kids. I would cite Los Angeles Unified, the largest school district in America, as living proof. We've created environments where you can't get a job when you're young. I've been attacked because I suggested that we find ways for poor children to work, and I want to defend it for a minute. If you live in a neighborhood where no one goes to work, if you have nobody near you who can teach you how to work, the number one thing you need to learn is how to show up. And then you need to learn that there's a connection between showing up and money. <laughs> and yet the entire modern liberal effort has been to isolate. The con I got into this 20 years ago when liberals were contemptuous of what they described as hamburger flipping jobs. And I'm a big fan of McDonald's because I like to study institutions that succeed. Just as I'm a big fan of Walmart because they're enormously successful. What, McDonald's has taught more people to show up for work than any other institution in America. Now, it's right. When you're young and you show up and you flip hamburgers for a while, you don't make a whole lot of money. But guess what? A, you can rise. If you work at it long enough, you can own the McDonald's. If you decide to go somewhere else, you can own whole companies. If you looked at the number of business leaders who started at something like that, it's amazing. When I talk to first generation millionaires and billionaires, they all went to work young. The other day I got an email from my granddaughter Maggie, who is now 12. And she said, ha, I am writing you on my iPad. <laughs> and I wrote back and I said, how did you get an iPad? And she said, I have saved all of my money for eight months and I bought it. And I wrote, I wrote my daughter, and she wrote back how proud she was that Maggie would not buy anything else. No candy, no movies. She had a goal. She was going to get to that goal. Now, that's what you want the poorest children in America to learn. And so that's what I was trying to say the other day when I said, you know, we should contemplate very seriously that the poorest children in the poorest neighborhoods ought to actually have part-time jobs in the schools they have to go to. And I was promptly attacked, Gingrich wants to trap the poor as janitors. <laughs> and then I was told, janitors do really dangerous hard work. <laughs> well, the master janitor probably ought to do the dangerous hard work. But I will tell you, personally, I believe the kids could mop the floor and clean out the bathroom and get paid for it, and it would be okay. And candidly, this is one of the great fears of liberalism. If they learned that at the end of the week they got money for doing work, they might want to do more work, <laughs> in which case they would get more money. And then they would cease to be poor. And then who would rich liberals worry about? <laughs> and so you have to think about this whole model. Now, I want to say two things in, in, in closing about this concept of rebuilding the America we love. The first is, I am going to bring a lot of ideas to the table. Some are going to be workable, some aren't. I'm going to ask all of you to bring a lot of ideas to the table. What we know today is that the old order ain't working. And therefore, we ought to have the courage to be Americans. I always tell people, the Wright brothers decided they were fascinated with flying. They had no academic degrees. They got no government grants. They built their own wind tunnel. They studied birds. 
And when they went down to, and the one thing they did with the government is they asked the Weather Service, what's the best place in America for a con continuous updraft, which turned out to be Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. They're sitting in Dayton, Ohio, back at a time when the only way you could get there was by train. So in the early summer, they would put a lot of wood on the train and go down to Kitty Hawk and build an airplane. They did this for, I think, three years in a row. And I always tell audiences, they always took a lot of extra wood because they knew something very profound. They didn't know how to fly. <laughs> and therefore, they were going to crash the plane. <laughs> and they would get up in the morning. And they would go out and have a cup of coffee. And then they would launch the plane. And it would crash. <laughs> and they would fix it. And they would talk about what do we think went wrong. And they would practice some more. They did this for three years. On December 1903, it flew. The distance it flew was shorter than the wingspan of a Boeing 747. It never got high enough to get over the fuselage of a Boeing 747. And the run br one brother ran along next to it to keep it from flipping over. <laughs> but it flew. Four, less than four years later, they flew an airplane around the island of Manhattan, and a million and a half people saw it. That's how fast progress occurred. Now, why am I telling you this story? Because I'm asking you to embark with me on a voyage of invention and discovery, to be as bold and as courageous as the Wright brothers, to reach out in education, in health, in immigration, in national security, in job creation, in every aspect of American life, to rebuild this extraordinary country. I can't guarantee you success. As Churchill said at the darkest moment in British history, I can promise you blood, sweat, toil, and tears. I can promise you I will do everything I can to rebuild this country for my grandchildren. I also want to say to you, I will not ask a single one of you to be for me. Because if you're for me, you're going to vote, go home, and say, I sure hope Newt fixes it. It is impossible, even for the president, to undertake a rebuilding on this scale. What I will do is ask you to be with me so that side by side for eight years, we remind the Congress of why we hired them. We remind the governor and the legislature. We remind the school board and the city council and the county commission. Also, because I want you to remind me, I want to set up a social network that allows you to say, that ain't quite working, or here's a better idea, or the world has changed, you better switch gears. And finally, because if we implement the 10th Amendment and we reduce the size of government of Washington, we have to grow citizenship back home. And I want to be able to turn to you and say, if you're with me, I need you to help do this. This is the most important election, I believe, in our lifetime. If Obama's reelected and he comes to believe that his radicalism was vindicated, despite the economy, despite the deficit, despite everything, I can't imagine what his second term would be like. So this is really a big deal. I want to say one last thing. If I am your nominee, with your help, I will challenge the president to seven three-hour Lincoln-Douglas-style debates with a timekeeper and no moderator. To be fair, I will agree that he can use a teleprompter. <laughs> After all, if you had to defend Obamacare, wouldn't you want a teleprompter? <laughs> now, some of our friends think he won't agree. I think there are three reasons he will agree. First. 
he announced in February of 2007 in Springfield quoting Lincoln. Second, just pure ego. How does a Columbia Harvard Law graduate, editor of the Law Review, greatest orator in the Democratic Party, look in the mirror and say he's afraid to stay on the same platform with a West Georgia College professor? <laughs> but third, as many of you know, I've studied history. And unlike the president, I've studied American history. Abraham Lincoln, in 1858, had been out of office for 10 years. He only served one term in Congress, a number of terms in the state legislature, went back home, spent 10 years out of office. When he announces against the most famous senator in the United States and the presumed next president, he said there are 105 days left. Let's debate every day. Douglas said, I don't think so. So for the next several weeks, everywhere Douglas went, Lincoln arrived the next day and rebutted Douglas, and after about three weeks, Douglas figured out the newspaper coverage was always Lincoln's rebuttal. <laughs> and so Douglas said, all right, I'll agree to the debates. There were nine congressional districts. Lincoln had already been in two of them chasing him, so he said, we'll do seven. That's how it started. Now, what's the modern parallel? If you help me become the nominee, in my acceptance speech in Tampa, if the president has not yet agreed I will announce that as of that evening, the White House will be my scheduler. And wherever the president goes, I will show up four hours later and respond to his speech. Just remember, with your help, we will rebuild the country we love. But only if we, the American people, are willing to do it. Thank you, good luck, and God bless you.